This legendary talisman is a treasure of Noxtella, the Eternal City. This talisman represents the lost black moon. The moon of Noxtella was the guide of countless stars. The memory stone gives us an idea of what this black moon looked like. A black, lightly beguiling stone prized by the sorcerers who produced them, said to be a fragment of the black moon that once hung above the Eternal City. The Eternal Cities, once great and formidable, now lie in the depths of the lands between. But it seems that these cities still teem with life in the ruins of an ancient civilization. The influence of this society is seen all throughout the lands between. Although they were exiled below ground long ago and live under a false night sky, the Nox still thrive with the ability to develop and control fate. It is said that they await the coming age of stars and their lord of night. The ancestral race, the precursors of the lands before the eternal cities existed, seemingly worship the cycle of life and death. The ancestral followers keep their distance from the Erd tree, awaiting new buds. They are certain to sprout from their very flesh, and indeed, their souls. If we look deeper into this, we can surmise that the ancestral race derived their use of magic from this phenomena. Horns with buds that also shine are ideal items for ancestral worship. The shining horned headband have these small blue growths, which seems to have imbued the headband with this magical power, making the ancestral infant's head stronger, which is the skull of a very young ancestral spirit. Just think how many sproutings it might bear. The ancestral followers believe that the horns of a long-lived beast continue to bud like antlers over and over again until the beast one day becomes an ancestral spirit. It's said that ancestral spirits exist as a phenomenon beyond the purview of the Erd tree. Life sprouts from death as it does from birth. Such is the way of the living. When we obtain the ancestral spirit's horn, we can see a number of new growths bud from the antler-like horns of the fallen king, each glowing with light. Thus does new life grow from death, and from death one obtains power. This power is the magic we see the ancestral race use. The winged great horn in the ancestral spirit worshipping faith is considered the envoy's wings, made to reap the lives of the beings which experience no sprouting. To put this plainly, the ancestral infants that do not sprout new horn buds are killed and their corpses are used as a sort of fetish to channel this life and death magic. Expected practices for an ancestral race. Existing alongside the ancestral race are the claimen, who infest dynastic remains. Bowed with age, the claimen are sluggish but hard to stagger. The warped remains of priests who search for revelation in service of the ancient dynasty. They employ two sorceries that produce smaller and larger bubbles. The claimen search for lost oracles within their bubbles. To clear up the connection between the claimen and the ancestral race, the claimen would search for oracles within their bubble magic as explained, and if found, these oracles would then meditate revelation to the claimen, which would then be given to the ancestral race. A theory of mine is that the claimen would help the ancestral race deepen their knowledge in the magic they use by giving them these revelations. Estelle, natural born of the void, a malformed star born in the lightless void far away, once destroyed an eternal city and took away their sky and falling star of ill omen. The wing of Estelle is a sword fashioned from a delicate wing, suffused with the magic of the stars, crafted from a relic of the natural born of the void, who is said to have assailed the Eternal City. The Eternal City, in the description, is not one of the Eternal Cities with which we first visit, but rather the last one. And with some environmental storytelling, we can deduce that this is the nameless Eternal City. When we arrive here, the destruction of this city is apparent, as the buildings are collapsed and sinking with overgrowing roots all throughout the area. The meteorite of Estelle is a manifestation of the power with which Estelle leveled the Eternal City. Estelle used this conjuring of a volley of meteorites when he assailed the nameless Eternal City. In the description of his remembrance, it is also said that he took their night sky. We can take this quite literally, because when we find Estelle, 
he's holed up in a giant cavern with the same night sky as the other two eternal cities. One of my theories on why Estelle appeared has to do with the eternal darkness and the moon of Noxtella. The moon of Noxtella was the guide of countless stars, and Estelle, being a living star, was perhaps led here by this moon. Eternal darkness is a forbidden sorcery in Celia, town of sorcery, originally a lost sorcery of the eternal cities. The despair that brought about its ruin made manifest. We can observe that it's a hole that goes into what looks to be an abyss. In my former video on the primeval current, I speculate that this abyss is the primeval current itself. Further into my theory, I believe that this sorcery was perhaps used as a sort of spatial opening to guide stars to the cities, and Estelle being a star was also guided here, thus the event of him assailing the nameless eternal city and stealing its night sky. The Nox are a seemingly reviled group, known for creating mockeries of life and developing forbidden magic. Long ago, the Nox invoked the ire of the Greater Will, and were banished deep underground. Now they live under a false night sky, in eternal anticipation of their liege, of the coming age of the stars, and their lord of night. They wield blades forged of a liquid metal. The Nox flowing sword, a grim weapon wielded by the swordsmen of the Eternal City. This shotel has a blade as fine as a needle, forged from the liquid metal of a silver tear. It is thoroughly tempered until hardened. And the Nox flowing hammer, a mace shaped like a suspended metal droplet wielded by monks of the Eternal City. Forged from the same liquid metal from a silver tear, it is also thoroughly tempered until hardened. These weapons can have a liquid estate, where the sword becomes a sort of whip, and the hammer or mace can be turned into what seems to be two small shields, or gauntlets, which seems to be exclusive to the monks, as it is not an obtainable weapon art. The women of the Eternal City wear the Night Maiden's twin crowns, indicating the highest clerical rank. The Nox Sorcerer's crown is worn by women who are the personal guards of the Night Maidens. The Nox Monk hood is worn by the monks, and the Nox Mirror helm is a helm fashioned from a crystal-looking glass. One among the Eternal City's ritual implements, it is easily broken and weak against striking attacks. Being worn by those committed to high treason, it wards off the intervention of the Greater Will and its vassal fingers. As stated before, the Nox were banished underground, living under a false night sky, awaiting the Age of Stars. The Finger Slayer Blade is the hidden treasure of the Eternal City of Nokron, a blade said to have been born of a corpse. This blood-drenched fetish is proof of the high treason committed by the Eternal City and symbolizes its downfall. It cannot be wielded by those without a fate, but is said to be able to harm the Greater Will and its vassals. To speculate, I believe that this blade was used to kill all the two fingers that resided on top of the Divine Towers, as a way to cut off those who possess shards of the Elden Ring from the Greater Will. To support this theory, we can refer to Rani using it to slay her fingers in her questline. The Black Knife Assassins were a group of women that carried out the deeds of the Knight of the Black Knives and are rumored to be Newman who had close ties with Merica herself. After Fia gives us a clue to the whereabouts of a Black Knife print, we discover the Black Knife Catacombs, and upon defeating one of the Black Knife Assassins, we find the Black Knife print. It details that, on the Night of the Black Knives, someone stole a fragment of death from Malakin, the Black Blade, and imbued its power into the Assassin's daggers. This mark is evidence of the ritual, and hides the truth of the conspiracy. When we speak to Rajir, he brings up the misshapen corpse under Stormfail, stating that it's a relic of the Black Knife's plot on the famed night of the assassination. He tells us that it happened during the Golden Age of the Erdtree, long before the shattering of the Elden Ring. Someone stole a fragment of the Root of Death from Malekith, the Black Blade, and on a bitter night, murdered Godwin the Golden. This was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history, and it became the catalyst. Soon, the Elden Ring was smashed, and thus sprang forth the war known as the Shattering. When we show him the black knife print, he says he can scarcely believe we managed to get our hands on it. He asks if we recall our conversation about the Knight of the Black Knives, 
stating that it is said that the assassins who carried out the deed were scions of the Eternal City, a group entirely of women arrayed in armor of silver under cloaks which fooled the eye. The knives they wielded, though, were imparted with the power of the Rune of Death through Sinister Rite. He then asked us to lend him the knife print for a time, and that he loved nothing more than to tease out its secrets. Though only a fragment, a very specific ritual had to be performed to impart the power of the Rune of Death. Traces of the one who performed the rite are sure to remain in the imprint. When we speak to him again, he says his examination is complete and gives us the knife print back, thanking us. He then says that he has a fairly good idea who performed the rite upon the blades, the person who orchestrated the Knight of the Black Knives. To our surprise, he says that it's Lunar Princess Rani, one of the children born to King Consort Radigan and his first wife, Renala, demigod and sister to General Radon and Praetor Rikard. Hers was the name he discovered in the imprint. We can confirm this information from Rani herself. She also tells us that she was once an Empyrean, and of the demigods, only she, Mikola, and Melania could claim the title. Each of them were chosen by their own two fingers as a candidate to succeed Merica and become the new god of the coming age. And she received Blythe in the form of a vassal tailored for an Empyrean. But she would not acquiesce to the two fingers, so she stole the rune of death, slaying her own Empyrean flesh and casting it away, refusing to be controlled by the two fingers. Thus, the baleful shadows lie in wait to assassinate Rani. One thing I found curious about Ronnie telling us of the Night of the Black Knives is she doesn't mention Godwin's murder. For this, I have two theories. The first is that since the Black Knives had close ties with Merica, they took the opportunity while having the Rune of Death imbued into their blades to assassinate Godwin in order to, in quotes, get revenge for Merica betraying the Eternal Cities and the Nox in favor of the Golden Order. The second is that Rani needed another vessel for the hallow brand of death to be bestowed upon, but instead of it going entirely to Godwin's corpse, it was broken, and half remained on Rani's corpse. Thus Rani died in flesh, and Godwin in soul. Godwin's flesh still lives and thrives below in the nameless eternal city, but that is a topic for my future video on death. Tish was one of the assassins who, on the night of the plot, imbued her black knife with the rune of death and slew Godwin the Golden. She was the daughter of the black knife ringleader Electo and was killed protecting her mother during their flight from the royal capital. We come to discover that Electo herself still lives as we face her in the ringleader Everjail in Liurnia. In order to go unseen, the black knives use concealing veils, talismans put together from dark cloth with a lustrous sheen completely concealing the wearer's presence while crouching at a distance from foes, part of one of the concealing veils used by the assassins on the Night of Black Knives. From this talisman, I visualize what it must have been like to be Godwin on the night of his assassination, being seized by some invisible force and having a blade thrusted into you, sapping your life away, only to see the slight fray in your vision for any clue as to what this or these beings are. These assassins, as is their title, wielded black knives, daggers once belonging to the assassins who murdered Godwin the Golden on the night of the black knives, oddly shaped blades imbued with the power of the rune of death. The assassins' crimson dagger and cerulean daggers are misshapen and stained, one restoring health and the other restoring focus. These charms are modeled after the darkly gleaming blades used in the night of the black knives those which gave the demigods their first taste of death. Knowledge on the Newman is seldom, save for they came from outside the lands between and are rumored to be descendants of denizens from another world. Queen Merica is a Newman, and the Black Knives are rumored to be Newman with close ties to Merica. And with some environmental storytelling, we can deduce that either the Nox and Newman are one and the same, or they coexisted within the Eternal Cities as we find Newman runes within the caverns that riddle the underground domain, either on corpses or by killing these ants with sacks that are feeding on the corpses of what is speculated to be Newman. We also find these runes in Elphiel, Brace of the Halleck Tree, and Dialos Hoslo drops a Newman rune upon his death in Jarburg at the end of his questline.
The Nox are deeply invested in their magic and are extremely influential to the lands between with all of their aspects of it. Their magics are based upon the moon and stars. One could speculate that this is precursor primeval sorcery. The primeval current became a widely known aspect during the height of the time period for Raya Lucaria Academy and the Karian Royals, as I have previously covered. Starlight shards were used in these drafts to make puppets of the creatures that consumed it. I do speculate that it was first used on animals, then later tested on humanoids. One would administer this draft with part of their own essence within it. It would then connect the consumer's fate to their own, effectively taking their spirit from their body, enabling the administrator to use it for their own will. Preceptor Celibus tells us that the soul of every puppet has its own ambience and will soon come to know, once we possess a few and each his predilections are known to us, the better we'll be able to, in quotes, love them. I believe this is just him telling us that the more familiar we are with using the puppet, the more we'll master using them. Amber starlight, an ephemeral sliver that gives off a pale amber glow, the remains of a passing flash of starlight. If the stars command our fates, then amber-hued stars must control the fates of the gods. Such is the belief that inspired the use of these shards to prepare a most special draft. It cannot be consumed by mere humans. Celestial dew is used for absolution. Pastor Muriel at the Church of Vows tells us that in order to experience the miracle, we must kneel in the basin at the back and cleanse ourselves in celestial dew. Absolution is defined as a form of release from guilt, obligation, or punishment, or an ecclesiastical declaration of forgiveness of sins. Priests are known to give absolution to penitents, and we can see this reflected here at the Church of Vows with Pastor Muriel. It is seen throughout the Eternal Cities that the Nox were attempting to create their own forms of life, to both further their study in the Arcane and to amass force to overthrow the Greater Will. The Dragonkin soldiers are a curious example of this, as I have scarce evidence as to how they came to be other than through the Nox and their experimentation. My theory, which has very, very little backing, is that the Nox possibly obtained gravel stones and used them on the trolls that they were allied with in such a way in order to create the Dragonkin. However, I am certain that these are trolls, as they have their abdomens hollowed out and they wear the same capes as E.G. and the other Karian troll knights but I could be wrong. The dragonkin were born in the Eternal City, where they knew no true sky nor true lightning. Instead, ice lightning was their weapon. We can gain further understanding of the dragonkin with the dragon scale blade, a weapon made by sharpening a gravel stone scale, thought to be the source of ancient dragon immortality into an unclouded blade. Alas, the dragonkin soldiers never attained immortality, and perished as decrepit, pale imitations of their skyborn kin. From this, we can confirm that the dragon kin were essentially failed experiments, as they cannot fully fly, are crippled, they cannot use true lightning, and can die of a natural death. The silver tears are living pools of liquid silver that change form. The larval tear is the core of a creature of mimicry known as a silver tear, as much as a substance as it is a living organism allowing one to be born anew. The Silver Tear Mask is a mask fashioned from the corpse of a formless Silver Tear, supported by its hardened shed husk. To imitate the imitator is a cunning play indeed. Silver Tear Husks are a hardened husk shed by a formless life form known as the Silver Tear, found in and around the Eternal City. The Silver Tear makes a mockery of life, reborn again and again into imitation. Perhaps one day it will be born, Lord. The Mimic Tear Ashes are a spirit that takes the form of the Summoner to fight alongside them, but its mimicry does not extend to imitating the Summoner's will. Mimic Tears are the result of an attempt by the Eternal City to forge a Lord. This Mimic Tear has the same form as the Silver Tears, meaning that this puppet made from one of them as the Silver Tears can not only take the form of another, but also take the form of the Night Folk, Few in number, the night folk were said to bleed silver long ago. One could speculate that this humanoid species was the origin of the Silver Tears and that they were used to fabricate the creation of the Silver Tears. Additionally, the silver spheres we see around the Eternal City are also Silver Tears, as they drop larval tears, and the weapons of the Nox were made from this same liquid substance, leading me to believe that they would sacrifice the Silver Tears to forge them. 
Alas, the Silver Tears can take many forms and are formidable, to say the least. The Albinarchs are another species that can bleed silver or white and are also found in the Eternal Cities. Albinarchs are life forms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live in pure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. The Albinaric shield is a tall oval shield made of metal carried by young Albinarchs. The ornamentation represents the primordial drop of dew from which they are said to have been created. The Albinarchs' most formidable foes were sorcerers, after all. The Ripple Blade is a unique weapon wielded by young Albinarchs. This sword is modeled after the ripples that are thought to be the origin of their species and the Ripple Crescent Halberd is wielded by young Albinorics. The persecution and disdain of the Albinorics is seen throughout the lands between, with the Albinoric Mask and the Albinoric Pot. The Blue Silver Set is said to be worn by the wolf-riding Albinoric Archers. Blue Silver is a metal born from the same mother as the Archers themselves, and provides protection from magic and frost. Latena the Albinoric is one of these Archers, after being given the right half of the secret hailing tree medallion and told by Albus in the Albinoric village to go and see her, she chooses to become a spirit voluntarily. Latena was renowned as a deft magic archer, but having lost her beloved wolf companion Lobo, she cannot move from the place where she was summoned. For her questline, we travel to the mountaintop of the giants to retrieve the other half of the medallion and deliver her to the land of Amygdala's hailing tree. When we reach the apostate derelict, we find a tall Albinoric woman. We then summon her and she gives the towering Albinoric woman the birthing droplet, finishing her quest line. We know of three eternal cities in the Mogwin Palace that exist underground. The eternal city and the Nox were banished underground. As discussed before, while some speculate that the cities were built underground, my theory earlier is that the cities did in fact exist above ground as one entire city. But once they were put below ground, they had to build more constructs to adapt to the new environment. We see towers and buildings built into the cavernous walls and ceilings, bridges and dams to control the water and allow ease of access throughout the tunnel system, and elevators that bring them to the surface world. We then have the giant thrones in the cities and one in Celia, of which little is known save for they harbor ghost glovewort. White flowers that bloom in catacombs, spirits nestle closely to these grand specimens. Since times of old, large glove warts were used to comfort heroic spirits, given in tribute to those who died the most glorious of deaths, and hoped their stories would become legend. There are two of these thrones that are occupied by giant skeletons, so perhaps these glove wart are put here as tribute to these grand skeletons. We also find the Finger Slayer blade in the chest below the throne in Nocron, the Moon of Noxtella in the Throne of Noxtella, and Lusat's staff in the throne of Celia. Celia is renowned for developing gravity sorceries, but the town harbors a dark secret. From what I gather from the descriptions in the different gravity sorceries, all of these sorceries originated from the Onyx or Alabaster Lords, who were feared for their destructive power. It can be speculated that the Onyx Lords thrived in Celia at one point, but we find them scattered throughout the lands between during our travels. In a note Gowrie gives us, it says that the town of Celia hides the source. Light three flames atop the candle towers to break the seal. To get an inkling as to what this dark secret of Celia is, we can find a throne exactly like the ones we find in the Eternal Cities, with which we find Lusat's staff inside. We can confirm this relation to the Eternal Cities with the Eternal Darkness Sorcery. The Celian sorcerers were assassins, and it is said they often hunted their fellows. They used the night sorceries of Celia, town of sorcery. To carry out assassinations, they would use the unseen blade to present themselves as unarmed, an unseen form to make themselves semi-invisible even when in motion. And the Night Maiden's Mist is one of the night sorceries of Celia. Below Celia, the eternal city of Nocron sleeps. This sorcery originates from the Maiden of that place. The influence of the Nox is apparent all throughout the lands between, from the architecture, taboo, and occult practices and aspects of sorcery. It seems as though everywhere we look there's Nox influence present, with the Academy, Celia, and Ordina having little details with their architecture, their magic, and even the figureheads of these places. 
and the Karian royal family whose fate is written in the stars, with Renala and Rani finding their own moons, just as the Nox had their black moon. It is quite possible that this is the work of a greater being pulling the strings, or that it is all by chance and it has no greater meaning. Regardless of this statement, the greater will and the golden order had every reason to want to contain the Nox. They were by far the largest threat to them and potentially all others, as they were able to create and control life, manipulate death, militarize their creations, develop sorceries and specialized weaponry, carry out large assassination operations, govern themselves, and spread their influence throughout the lands between, which is quite impressive from a political standpoint. While this makes them seem villainous and evil, it is no different from the Golden Order who have their own culture, governance, and military. If you made it to the end of this video, you have my thanks. I'd like to give a special shout out to Dim, a real world friend and member of my Discord, who helped me with the lore that attributed and surrounded the concept of this video. I'd also like to credit Vadi Vidya and Smotown, whose individual videos on the Eternal Cities solidified and added to a lot of the information contained in my own. I'll link their channels down below. Like the video, comment your thoughts, and subscribe for more content. I'll see you in the next one.